All right, praise the name of the Lord, friends and families all over the world. Are you excited to be at church today? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. Even though the only chance we have is to collaborate through this technology, nonetheless, God is here. If you plug your faith, you plug your expectations over to this technology, something, something divine is going to happen to your heart. <laughs> so God is here. Welcome to church. Well, this is church at Hero Smart. And Heroes Mark is a ministry set up by God for the discipleship of the nations. In keeping with the instruction of Yahushua in Matthew chapter 28, which says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you to do. And surely I will be with you till the end of the age. And in trying to keep this instruction in this ministry, God's given us the great privilege to create a resource through which we can do that very well. That resource we title the Online Discipleship Program or the ODP in short. And the ODP is a set of studies from the Word of God, which may be sectioned in five major categories of studies. The pharmacy section of the Word, the milk section of the Word, the meat section of the Word, the water section of the Word, and combination meals. And in coming through the 2022 session of the ODP, God's given us the great privilege to come, to come through the pharmacy aspect of it, the milk aspect of it, the meat aspect of it, the water aspect of it, and we are right now in the combination meals section of the ODP. Um, and the combination meals section of the ODP, of course, will leverage understandings of pharmacy concepts, milk concept, and meat concept, and water concept, so that we can internalize what God is going to be teaching us through combination meals. And what God intends to pass across through these series of messages, uh, this series of messages, the combination meals aspect of it actually, is to let us know where we are with regards to end time events. So we've been studying um, end time events, especially uh, based on the nudging and the uh, pointer that we got from the book of Daniel. Uh, that's what we call end time over here, and not necessarily because we're seeing earthquakes and pestilences on the outside. Well, those things are going to be pointers as well, but significantly, what's going to let us know that we are in the end, based on Bible terms, started from the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12. And we are going to try to further this conversation today with End Time Snapshot, Part 3, Week Number 50. So this is uh, <laughs> getting close to the end of the ODP for 2022. And because our messages actually build on each other, it's not going to be fair on you if you are just trying to jump in and start with Week Number 50. Uh, if you haven't listened to Weeks Number 1 to 49, what I'm talking about may not really make a lot of sense to you and you know you're going to do yourself a lot of favor just to start week number one well our messages are on our youtube channel youtube.com slash heroes march you are going to see all our messages over there when you see 2022 playlist you can take your time just to study along with us if you really want to be a part of it um and then uh 2023 is going to be coming up shortly uh, I believe the portal is open right now for people to register. So if you want to be a part of next year's ODP, just go to heroespark.com slash church. You are going to see a place over there to register for next year's ODP. Uh, you're welcome to be part of this live service if you really want to glean additional graces for what's coming from the messages. Right for week number one, please and please avail yourself of that opportunity. But for the, for the rest of our friends who have come through weeks number 1 to 49, this is going to be week number 50 right now to further the combination meals aspect of the ODP, and we are going to title it End Time Snapshot Part 3. Hallelujah. End Time Snapshot Part 3 is what we're going to be talking about today, and it's going to further End Time Snapshot Part 2 and Part 1. In part two and part one, we talked about what the end time is. The end time is going to be a season during which knowledge will increase significantly in the earth, which scripture tells us that. Well, that's going to be Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. And the Bible says, uh, based on the words of the angel that God sends to Daniel to give him uh, certain tips into what will happen in the end of times, 
And he presented Daniel at an overview level because the angel really wasn't sure of the details because the details are going to be really dependent on how the nation of Israel behaved themselves in certain instances. And he told Daniel, well, I can't give you all the details right now. I can just present to you an overview. Because beloved brother Daniel was very inquisitive. And he was trying to press for the angel to show him additional details. And the angel said, well, the only detail that I can share with you right now, they are going to be the details that will occur from 500 B.C. to about 0 B.C. Uh, talking about how the exiles were going to return to the land of Judah. They had been uh, whisked away to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar because of their stubbornness and sins. And uh, uh, God prophesied through Jeremiah and all the other prophets that, well, you guys are going to spend 70 years in Babylon. So they spent about 70 years in Babylon. And after about 70 years, people like Daniel started knocking on the gates of heaven and asking God to remember his promises and started making supplications. And God said, well, I'm going to come out for you and I'm, I'm going to deliver you. And then Daniel started asking questions. Well, what's going to happen when you bring us over? So uh, the angel started giving Daniel understanding right from Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. And then he went ahead and started talking about things that will happen in the distant future in chapter 12. And then Daniel was like, well, uh, this distant, distant things that are going to happen in the future, can you give me additional details into it? And the angel said, no, 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 Daniel, this is not for your generation. Seal up the scroll until the time of the end. Because during the time of the end, you are going to see people moving left, right, or center, to and fro to increase knowledge. That's how you're going to know it's the time of the end and the scroll has been opened. And in our generation for about 600 years, we've seen that to be categorically what's been happening. We've seen increased transportation left, right, or center. Ever since 1500s, we've seen increased, increased, a significant increase in humanity's knowledge. The amount of knowledge and information that has pelted the atmosphere since 1517 up until 2022 is absolutely unprecedented. For 5,000 years, ever since the formation of the earth and the Garden of Eden, from the time of Adam up until 1517, humanity was riding donkeys and fighting on horsebacks. Living in huts and teepees and we didn't know. We, we had no clue. If you were to tell people who lived during the time of the Old Testament that uh, you're going to be having this kind of technology to, <laughs> to talk to people real time across the oceans, they're going to think that you got some magical power. And that's the reason you're going to read the book of Revelation. During the time of the Antichrist, beloved brother Paul saw the image of the beast talking from the wall. And in his mind, he thought, well, this is so magical. He's got some supernatural powers. It, the image of the beast is going to be talking from the wall? Wow. 2,000 years ago, it's going to look like a big deal to you. But right now, it's not a big deal. That's just projection TV. So what I'm talking about right now, you connect your projector to your computer and you slash it onto a wall, you're going to see my image talking, talking like that. And if you actually want to get technical, you can start using holograms to have a 3D depiction of what I'm talking about. That's what beloved brother John saw on the Isle of Platmus, Patmos 2,000 years ago, and he thought he was just absolutely wizard for this is this good man, this false prophet is going to be a wizard. His image is going to be talking to people. In this generation, is that a big deal? It's not a big deal. But 2,000 years ago, it was a big deal, and it was documented as one of the signs of the end. <laughs> Would you believe this Bible? <laughs> 2,000 years ago, the book of Revelation was documented that what's going to be happening to the first century. And you doubt the God of the Bible? Mm -hmm. A smart idea. <laughs> so that's what's been happening in this generation for about 600 years right now. Increase of knowledge. Significant knowledge. Since 1517, ever since the Reformation in Germany, 
the Protestants movement, the Protestant movement that started over there, and then many people came in the name of knowing the Messiah. Out of a genuine interest to want to know God, but their understanding is a little limited, and it's incomplete, the gospel that came out of that. And some, somebody <laughs> asked, yeah, I believe last week, that you know, why did God permit Siwa? And my question to him is, knowledge out of build on each other. And you look at the technologies that we have in this generation. Your own laptop in 2022 is going to be more powerful than an IBM computer, mainframe computer of the 1960s, which probably cost about $100,000. And your laptop, $5,000, is going to do a whole lot more work than the IBM computer that started in 1960. But did you know that your 2022 computer built on the fundamental principles with which the IBM mainframe computer worked in the 1960s. In other words, there would not be in your 2022 slick laptop computer without the foundation of IBM mainframe computer of 1960. The same thing with your cars. So you're driving, uh, um, self-driving cars left around, uh, around the 21st century. You're, you have that powered steering. You can literally turn that steering with your finger. Did you know that that was not the way it was in the 70s? You're driving a car back in the 70s. There is no automatic transmission. You could put in gear one and gear two and gear three, press the clutches over there. <laughs> this generation, they, they have no clue what that, what are you talking about? Gear one, they don't know. You just press the throttle and the car keeps on changing from gear one, gear two. It's, it keeps on downsizing for you. You don't know what's going on. Well, it didn't used to be like that. Driving a car was a lot of work back in the 70s and 80s and in, even close to the 90s. But right now, you've got automatic transmission. You have powered steering. You have air conditioning blowing in your face. But knowledge out of build on each other. That's the reason God had to start with two one. And well, the seal one had lots of incompleteness to it, and God winked at it. <laughs> Salvation is going to be by faith, and work's not important anymore. God winked at it. 1500, he winked at it. 1600, he winked at it. 1700, 1800, 1900, and he's trying to open his eyes a little bit and say, hey, boys, I'm going to tie the news on you. <laughs> You've been appropriating the powers associated with my name, but uh, abuse of it because of this incompleteness. And certain scenes are going to be open right now to add additional nuggets to this atmosphere so you can add completeness to what I taught you in 1500. That's the reason for it. Knowledge has to build on each other. He has to build on each other. Hallelujah. So my, my, many of us right now talking this ministry, we are a product of Seal One Gospel. I got saved in 988, and that's what he told me. Heaven is going to be a gift for you. Um, heaven is, um, is not a reward. It's going to be a gift for you. Salvation is by faith, and you're not know, God saved based on that. But when I started reading the Bible for myself, I'm, I'm starting to see, well, there are going to be additional details to this thing. There are different modes of salvation to start with. There is the recreation of, of your human spirit called the born-again experience. Well, that gets you delivered from sin and from the clutches of darkness. Well, that's what Paul was calling the gift in Ephesians chapter 2. But he didn't downplay the importance of works of, of obedience. Uh, but he downplayed the importance, the, the lack of importance of works of circumcision. That's what he downplayed. But then there are other modes of salvation which, which the Bible talks about. There is the uh, salvation of uh, uh, being raptured out of here. There is the salvation of inheriting your glory codes. We call that immortality. And there's the salvation of making over to heaven. All these are future salvations, which earlier patriarchs of faith were waiting for. Oh, I said, is that true? Correct. And the way you're going to get it, Jesus said, oh, that you want to inherit eternal life. Make sure you love God, love people. He told the rich young man that, that in the Bible, in the Gospels. Oh, really, is that it? So inheriting eternal life is going to be different from the gift of eternal life. That's correct. You can see all of that. Oh, but 1,500 years ago, they couldn't see that. 
Now, in the 21st century, if you remove lots of tradition a little bit away from your heart, you can see that. Why? It's because certain seals were opened in the heavens to pour knowledge into the earth's atmosphere and knowledge out of being on each other. Exactly the same way he operates in the realm of the natural as well. And God is permitted, was permitted of the seal one gospel in 1500. But right now, in the 21st century, if you close your heart to the understanding coming from uh, the complete gospel message, God's not going to be permitted of that anymore. The reason for it is darkness covers the earth and grows darkness to people. The onslaught of darkness in this generation, uh which Satan has unleashed because he understands that his time is getting to an end. Uh, you are going to need additional wisdom strategies, additional ammunition, spiritual ammunitions, to be able to overcome the gross darkness of this generation. You need gross light. That's the reason God's going to be adding completeness to all the messages that we've heard before in the past. But then under the guise of uh, my denominational traditions, and I say, well, I'm not going to believe that. The Father is not going to be approving of that strategy, and that's the reason for the chaos in the body of Christ. When the Father is not approving of you anymore, you're going to see there's no grace anymore. There's no mercy anymore. Things are going to start becoming difficult. Why? Because you, you stay stunned in your growth because the tradition is the back of your heart. And that's the reason in this ministry we go through the pharmacy section of the word every year. And that pharmacy is coming up again. It's going to clean you up like a mother. It's going to push tradition away from your mind. By the grace of God. Hallelujah. Or you can treat yourself to it real quickly. And come on, come on board right now so you get abundance of grace in your heart. Mercy in your heart so you can charge forward. There's too much darkness in the world. You need precision understanding. And that's the reason for end time snapshot by the grace of God and God showing us. So the end time is going to be a season during which knowledge will increase significantly the earth's atmosphere uh, for the sake of time. Well, okay, let's turn to it. Daniel chapter 12. I just glossed over it because we talked about it all through last week two weeks ago, but it's okay. Let's go ahead and turn to it real quick. Daniel 12, and in verse 4, just a real simple verse of scripture for you to understand what's going on. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Let us know that the scroll is not going to be sealed up forever. It's just going to be sealed until the time of the end. During the time of the end, it's going to be open. And how do you know it's being open? Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. And that simple line over there is going to help us understand what the end of the end of the end of the end times will be. And that happens to start from 1517 with the Reformation Gospel in Germany. The season during which the remainder of biblical prophecies will be fulfilled, and that's correct because we know that certain prophecies were fulfilled during the time of Daniel. We saw the rise of... Uh, the Greek nation and the Persian kingdom and all of that. We saw all of those happen already between 500 B.C. and 0 B.C. But then there are additional details like what this uh, angel talked about in Daniel 12 that haven't occurred. And some of them are occurring right now in the 21st century. It's the season during which the current age, the first heaven and earth will close. Which is the time during which God will withdraw, draw, withdraw humanity's rights to broken Based on Luke 20 and verse 34 and verse 40, Yahushua's second coming is one of the signs of the end. But it's not the only event of the end, and he will not close the age. Why? Because people will be getting married and be given in marriage for at least a thousand years after the second coming of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 65 alludes to that as well. We've been given a charge to know the season, even though we may not know the exact day or hour. So how do we know that seals are being opened, right? Knowledge has increased significantly since the 1500s to the 21st century. And this is not possible without the opening of the seals because God preserves knowledge. The book of Proverbs in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 12 says God guards knowledge. And we, we know that last, last week that there are going to be certain pieces of information 
that humanity is trying to press for that they wouldn't get in this generation up until the time of the false prophet. And God's going to release that knowledge into the earth's atmosphere just to test the hearts of people again. And some people are going to fall for it. Some people are going to come out and escape. We talked about all of that um, last week. Uh, people can go up to and fro more easily right now to create a platform for the spread of the gospel to give the Father a harvest of righteousness. Daniel was given an overview of the end time events, starting from Daniel chapter 7. He was given insights into the details that occurred from 500 BC to 0 BC, but he was not given the details of subsequent events. He was told to seal it up uh, until the time of the end. And these are the seals right now that Yahushua starts to open in the book of Revelation. And as Yahushua starts to open the book, the seals of the book of Revelation, we've come to understand the order of events. The order of events will include seal one, seal two, seal three, seal four, which is where we are right now in the 21st century, seal five, seal six, which is where, where our rapture is going to be, and then seal seven, which is going to include the judgment of the nations. And just to reiterate that point and to uh, potentially help uh, your mind to, remain, to retain it, I'm going to bring my board back right now in front of you so that we can see the order of events one more time. Watch with me. All right, order of events. So the order of end time events will include the opening of seven seals. Uh, seal one, which we believe occurred uh, starting from 1500s. The movement of the incomplete gospel, the father had to start from there. Um, and he was permitted of that. 600 years ago, but in this 21st century, he's going to be asking for additional details before he can get his approval. Well, seal one was the movement of the incomplete gospel message, and then right after that, it was seal two, which ushered the World War One, World War Two, as we know them. Seal number three ushered in scarcity and famine all over the Earth's atmosphere. Seal number four will include widespread death. A quarter of the world's population is going to be decimated. And that is, I believe, where we are right now in the 21st century. Seal five, there will be global persecution against the man-child company. Seal number six, there will be cosmic disturbances. Seal number seven, there's going to be the judgment of the nations. And then right after that, there's going to be what I call 7.1, 7.2, 7.3, 7 7.4. There's going to be pouring up uh, the trumpets, will be blown, and then a bowl of God's rock is going to be poured. How do we know that? We know that based on the structure of the book of Revelation, because the book of Revelation includes an overview of end time events from Revelation chapter 6 up until Revelation chapter 11. And then the details of the book of Revelation started getting poured out from chapter 12 up until chapter 22. Why? Because in Revelation chapter 11, uh, toward the close of that chapter, we were informed that the kingdom of the earth has returned over to the Lord our God. In Revelation chapter 11. You'll flip, flip over there, you're going to see that. But then in Revelation chapter 12, he says right now there's going to be chaos over here. Revelation chapter 13, the Antichrist is going to come. And I'll come on over that thought. The kingdom of the earth has returned to the kingdom of, to the Lord our God in chapter 11. How come the earth Antichrist is still reigning on earth right now? So the only way you can re rectify and reconcile that in your mind is, well, the Antichrist. And all those things over there, they are going to be details of the summary we talked about in chapter 6 to chapter 11. And if you, if you believe that, you are going to know that there are going to be certain events which the blowing of the trumpets are going to be from chapter uh, 10 and 11 over there. They are going to coincide to with the part of the bulls, which are going to be in chapter 6. You are going to see additional details of things that will happen. We're going to get into some of those things. So we are going to pick up right where we left off from seal number 6 and I believe to somewhere like 7.4 today. I don't think we go past 7.4. Um, this is 7.2 over there. Uh, and then next week we're going to do 7.5 and 7.6 and 7.7 about the grace of God. So please and please lock this order of events into your mind. It's going to summarize the book of Revelation just for you like that. It's not going to be a confusing book. It's the most complete uh, documentation of end-time events in the Bible. 
the book of Daniel, the book of Zechariah, Matthew, and all of his guys to talk to a little bit about end time events, they didn't have the precision understanding available in the book of Revelation. Why? I mean, for a number of reasons. The reason was uh, when Jesus gave beloved brother John the book of Revelation, Yahushua had spent uh, about, about 100 years with the Father, downloading additional nuggets and wisdom from the Father, and he knew exactly about how the Father plans to close the age. That's the reason the book of Revelation is going to be more detailed than Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6, we're talking about the same thing in an overview fashion. But the book of Revelation from chapter 6 up, up until chapter 22 had additional details which you are not going to see to that degree in the Gospels. You're not going to see to that degree in the book of Zechariah or in the book of Daniel even. No. The reason is the book was given when Yahushua had been with the Father for about a hundred years after he was raised from the dead. And how many people know that Jesus kept on growing in wisdom and stature? Even after he was raised from the dead. Evidence in the book of Revelation. If Yahushua knew about the details of trumpet one, trumpet two, trumpet three, seal one, seal two, seal three, in Matthew 24, on the Mount of Olives, when the disciples were asking him that question, why didn't he talk about it? He didn't know. He just had an overview of it. And later on, when he'd been with the Father, he understood that, well, nobody really knows the day and the hour, but only the Father knows. He said somewhere that even the Son of Man doesn't know. And letting you know that the Father is a distinct entity in which the Son of Man acknowledges his distinctness several times in the Gospels. He said, well, my, I myself, I do not know all those details. But then he got to be at the right, the right hand of the Father, uh, preparing a place for you and for me, and the Father's going to tell him, well, let me tell you what's going to happen. So this is this. Make a movie out of it and go show your boy over there on the Patmos. That's exactly what happened. So that's the reason the book of Revelation is going to be important for you to study. And don't get scared about it. Why? Because it says, blessed is he who takes to part everything that is written in this book. And that's what we've done. We've, take, we've taken our blessing from the book of Revelation. We're taking our blessing every year from the book of Revelation. We're not scared from it. We're not scared of it. <laughs> Aren't you glad, glory to God, the book of Revelation? Thank God for it. All right. So please commit this to memory, the best of your ability. Cross check with the scriptures in your study notes. And you're going to be on the same page with the rest of us by the grace of God. Did you get something from it? I sure hope so. All right. We're going to get into the knots and bolts of it right now. Please stay on board. All right, all right. So we are going to pick up right now with seal number six. Seal number six um, is going to be a follow-up to what we talked about last week with seal number one, supposed conqueror. Seal number two, conflicts on the earth. Seal number three, scarcity on the earth. Seal number four, widespread death all over the earth. Seal number five, the cry of the marchers. Now, seal number six is going to be the cosmic disturbances, and that's when our rapture actually occurs. The rapture of the main child company, which if you're listening to me in 2022, the door is still open right now to be a part of this company. The man child company is what we call it. Or I used to make plans to be a part of this company by believing the complete gospel message and abiding by its tenets. Its tenets are going to be to believe and call Yahushua Lord and obey the Father. You're going to see that, that qualification in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12. Now, pleasing the Father may be a little bit uh, difficult, I understand. I'm not going to... Uh, <laughs> Be dismissive of that challenge. Why? Because there's a spirit of disobedience in the air. Who wants to make sure they don't please the Father? Well, that's the reason Yahushua says, go teach people how to do it. You're not going to be able to please the Father just by thinking about pleasing the Father. There is a way to please the Father. And that way is called discipleship. That's what Matthew chapter 28 talks about. So you just uh, stick your head in the sand and all you know to do is just you know, think it's going to happen, happen to you. You're going to be pleased. No, you can't. 
There are spiritual forces. The infrastructure of Babylon is one of them. The spirit of disobedience in the air is one of them. The, the infirmities in your body and soul are going to be one of them. The traditions of, of man that you hold so dearly, they're going to be one. All these things are going to gang up as enemies against your spirit to keep you trapped in the vortex of sin and death. And sin and death. Sin and death. And you can't get out even though you were born again, supposedly. Until you learn the discipline of the master. And then you can fly. So it's no small feat to understand how to please the father. It is a significant feat. And that's the reason the father is not going to forget that labor of love. But he includes a lot of spiritual labor and discipline. To be able to stay pleasing to the father. We call that the only people put together. No, but I come nobody's talking about it. I don't care. That's their business. They have paper copies of the Bible, multiple copies of the Bible, and they still can't talk about the ODP. That is their business. I don't care. I run the race set before me, and I'm going to give accounts on the day of judgment the one who called me. I'm not coming into anybody's lane. I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus. You talk about it, you don't talk about it. Well, we're going to give account, but I'm going to run the race right set before me. Hallelujah. Keeping my eyes on the master. So it is important. It is very, very important for you to believe it's not going to be a small feat to understand how to please the Father. But nonetheless, it is doable. And some guys are doing in this generation, coming on board and become a part of the man-child company, that will exit with seal number six. Hallelujah. So we're going to be talking about all of that today right now by the grace of God. What is seal six? During seal six, when Yahushua stands to open seal number six, as documented in the book of Revelation, you're going to find that in Revelation chapter six and from verse 12. Now turn to it. You're going to see certain point and details over there that will jolt your minds to action to let you know the season and to be watching for certain things that will let you know the season of the next rapture. Revelation chapter six. And in verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat's air. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to the earth. As lay figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up. And every mountain and island was moved, removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the princes and the generals and the rich and the mighty man, every and every slave and every free, free man, hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they called to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And Miss Yahushua cracks the skies over. Oh, the book of Revelation doesn't document when the rapture is, is going to occur. Well, he, he did right over there. Can you see it? So they're going to go and start hiding in caves. Why are they hiding in caves? Cover us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who can stand. And all the evidence to let you know that some seals are going to be opened prior to the wrath of the Lamb. Because this is talked about in seal 6. Seal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 were opened prior to the wrath of the Lamb. And the wrath of the Lamb is going to occur in seal number 7. And that's when the Antichrist is going to be judged and with all the commotion that they've done over them. It's, all these things are just logically come together right now. So, well, anyway, this is, where, this is what's going to happen during seal six. So, let's look at it from the study notes. So, there are going to be great earthquakes, and that is potentially going to be indicative of a glorified resurrection experience, which our brother Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 50. From verse 51 to verse 52, because this is going to be similar to what happened when Yahushua was raised from the dead, together with some Old Testament saints in Matthew chapter 27 in verse 51. So the great earthquake over there is going to be similar to that experience. Now turn to Matthew chapter 27. 
Let's take a look at it, and in verse 51. This happened after the resurrection of the Lord, because I believe he was the first begotten from the dead. Even though this was documented that uh, it looked like certain people just go out of their graves immediately after Jesus died, that, that's not possible, because Yahushua had to be the first begotten from the dead. So you see over there in verse 50 of Matthew 27, it says, And when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I believe that. Then he goes ahead and says, The earth shook and the rocks split. The, top, the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of their tombs after the resurrection of Jesus, and they went into the holy city to a pyramid. So, so Matthew documented this thing a little bit unclearly in here. He shouldn't have documented verse 51 immediately after Jesus gave up the ghost. What happened was verse 51 occurred when Yahushua blasted out of the tomb. Why? Because Jesus... Yahushua had to be the first begotten from the dead. In other words, Yahushua is going to spend three days in hell. He came out of the tomb. Then all the rest of the Old Testament saints who were eligible for that mode of resurrection, they picked up their glorified resurrected bodies, and then they went to see their siblings over there in Jerusalem. And 40 days they kept on looking a little bit differently, talking about a lot of things that happened when Jesus was raised from the dead. Can you imagine that? And I believe saints like Daniel <laughs> actually picked up his glorified resurrected body over there to go with Jesus. Anybody else who wasn't eligible for it, they're just going to go up to heaven with their spirits. But some guys who were eligible for that mode of the resurrection, resurrection experience based on the amount of inheritances that they had downloaded onto their physical bodies, they came out of their tombs while Jesus, when Jesus, Yahushua, was raised from the dead in his experience. Matthew 27, verse 51. But together with that experience, the Bible says a great earthquake. So anytime you see a great earthquake, earthquake, especially in talking about end time events, most likely there is going to be a resurrection associated with it. And that's going to be correct because the Bible says that we all going to have something like that as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we talked about in the middle of the word, resurrection of the dead message in particular. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 51. Take a look at that. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15 and in verse 51. It says over there, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does perishable inherit imperishable. Listen to me. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Come on. So it says, Paul was saying over here that not everybody's going to go down to the grave. The people who will live during the time of the next rapture, their bodies are going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye. Well, that's a resurrection experience over there in the book of Revelation. Chapter 6, during seal 6 experience, alludes to that experience. There is going to be a great earthquake when seal 6 is opened. And I believe people like Paul and Peter, because their bones are still scattered all around the Middle East right now, even though their spirits are in heaven, their spirits are going to come out of heaven, pick up their bodies. That's the reason for the earthquakes. The earth is going to give out the body of Paul. Even though his body might not be cremated or digested by a whale, the molecules of his physical body are still around this planet, floating around in the atoms of nitrogen in the air or oxygen atmosphere. <laughs> Talk about a miracle. <laughs> his spirit is going to come out of heaven say, hey, Paul's body, come on. And you're going to see earthquakes just <laughs> putting his body back together again. His spirit is going to slide into that body right now, no longer perishable, but imperishable. The book of 1 Thessalonians talked about all that. It says our resurrection is not going to precede the resurrection of people like Peter, James, and Paul. They pick up their glorified resurrected bodies firstly, that's the reason for the earthquake during seal six. 
And we who are still alive during that season by the grace of God, we're going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye. What does that mean? Blood is going to be zapped away from the physical body and it's going to be replaced with the glory of God. And that has to happen in less than the split of a second or your body is going to fall down dead. That's the reason he has to be in a twinkling of an eye. He says, we are going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye. He did not say we are going to become out of here in a twinkling of an eye. The rapture is not going to occur in a twinkling of an eye. No, the rapture is going to occur within the space of about 40 days. Because that's what happened to Jesus when he was raptured out of here. He picked up his glorified physical body. He did a quick work in righteousness for about 40 days. And Yahushua gives me an invitation to follow after him. The least I can do is to believe what Master experienced. Because he gave me that invitation. And for your information, there have been three raptures that occurred as documented in the Bible that did not occur in the twinkling of an eye. Yahushua's rapture was not a twinkling of an eye because some people saw him. Elijah's rapture was not a twinkling of an eye. Elisha and the sons of the prophets saw him. Enoch's rapture out of here was not in a twinkling of an eye because some people saw him. So three raptures occurred already in the Bible and none of them was in a twinkling of an eye. What gives you the assumption then that your rapture will occur in a twinkling of an eye? No, it's not. Your change, our change will be in a twinkling of an eye. What is that change? Resurrection of the body. Mortality is going to be swallowed up by immortality based on the amount of inheritances, the seed of the resurrection that you download in your physical body over here on the side of eternity as you sustain the status of perfect obedience. And you grow your rightness relationship with the Lord, you are sowing the seed of immortality in your physical body. And during that season, God's going to look at it. Well, this, this seed is sufficient over there. Come on, get your glory coat right now. That's what's going to happen in seal six. What is seal six going to happen then? Well, seal six is not going to happen tomorrow. I can tell you that categorically. Why? Because seal four is not complete. And we talked about it. Seal four is the time that there's going to be widespread death all over the earth's atmosphere. A quarter of the world's population is going to decimate it. And I didn't say that. The one you call Jesus said that. Go read the book of Revelation. And that's not going to occur during the wrath of the Lamb. Some of us spurious preachers have talked about it. No, come on, read. Do you read? No, it's going to occur prior to the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb is going to occur subsequent after seal six. Seal four is going to happen. A fourth of the earth's population is going to be decimated. And that's not bad news if you're smart. Why should you be a part of the fourth that's going to be decimated? Why can't you be a part of three quarters? Why should you be a part of the two-thirds the body of Christ that's going to be decimated? Why can't you be a part of the one-third that's going to be refined like gold and silver and give the Father a harvest of righteousness? How do I be a part? Believe the complete gospel message and be a part of the man-child company. That's what we're talking about. It's good news. Now, but when we see a quarter of the world's population decimated, which is going to be approximately about two-thirds of the body of Christ, because God's trying to do away with the lukewarmness of the body and the lukewarm gospel. When you see all that completed, you know, seal four is completed, seal five is going to happen, and then seal six is going to happen. So, when will a quarter of the world's population be decimated? Well, we need prophetic extrapolation based on the statistics of seal two. In seal two, we know that. 100 million lives were killed by the impact of the large sword documented in seal number two as conflict, a significant conflict of all the earth, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdoms, widespread death, significant conflict of all the earth, and it occurred from 1918 to about 1945, which is less than 30 years, approximately 30 years, and that's going to be... Uh, Maybe a significant population of the world's atmosphere, maybe about a tenth of the world's population, or maybe a fifth. Of, I don't know how many people were living between 1918 and 1945. It might have been about maybe just about one billion or less than two billion. I, I can't tell that categorically. So if it took about 30 years with a large sword 
to decimate about 10% of the world's uh, population. Now, in sail forward to decimate 25% of the world's population, you're not going to get that done. And uh, any period of time quicker than 30 years to start with. And it's going to be much more than 30 years because this operation in sail forward is not a large sword anymore. It's a small sword based on the book of Revelation we read last week. And then secondly, its operation is by a pale horse rider. Which means it's not a fiery red horse anymore. It's not going to be the blazing intensity of it that people are going to die on Mars within a short period of time. So it's going to, it's going to span a couple of, of decades over there before this thing can happen, before civil war can get completed. So we're not going to see a quarter of the world's population decimated in 30, 20 years. But it's going to take between 50, 60, or even up to 70 years um, in some cases over there before civil war can be completed. Yep. So you're telling me that the rapture is not going to occur between 6 to 70 years? Well, it depends. Now, if some of our preachers in this generation keep tying God's hands, and God says, I'm going to get rid of lukewarmness in my body, and some of our preachers are going to be like Moses in the wilderness, and trying to say, hey, Father, don't do that, Father, don't do that, they delay further our exit from this planet. And that's, what, that's what's happening with the COVID. God wanted to accelerate certain things, and we had some weak belly people all over just crying to God, and saying, God, please don't do this right now. Why? Why wouldn't God do it? You're delaying the impact of righteousness on the earth, and that's the reason that COVID is still resurfacing in different parts, because God is not pleased. But your tradition is going to tell you that uh, COVID is not a work of God. It came from the devil or something like that, or sin on the planet. Keep deceiving yourself. How can there be a plague in your generation without God permitting of it. Come on. Go read your Bible. When last did you see the devil bring a plague on the nation of Egypt? No, he can't do that. He's not that powerful. God is behind those guys. And that's the reason you're going to solve this over there. There's going to be a variant of it coming up later down the road. There's going to be something else. There's going to be monkeypox. And there's going to be all of this just to let you know the Father's trying to make a point. And the custodians of knowledge in the body of Christ are sleeping per capita. So if you keep on pushing the hands of God, you're going to be like Moses in the wilderness, and you yourself may not be able to enter the promised land in that mode, because that's what happened to Moses. God told him in the wilderness, let me get rid of these rebels right here. Their hearts are too calloused. They are not worthy of the promised land. They're going to clip your destiny and potentially hurt my purpose in the future. I get rid of them, I clean them out, and I'm still going to fulfill my promise to Abraham through you, to Abraham through you, and to fulfill the plan of redemption which I started in the Garden of Eden. But Moses, pulled by his sentiments, kept on begging God, God, don't do this. And well, God's going to say, okay, I'm going to relax a little bit. And they're going to do something else, and God's going to kill up thousands of them with a plague. The plague is going to break out. Moses is going to go over there and say, oh, Father, please don't do this. And God's going to relax. They're going to do something. God's going to wipe them out with an earthquake. And that kept on going on and on and on and on and on until Moses himself, he is hanging out with all these bad guys in the wilderness. His good manners become, became corrupted. And he couldn't make it to the promised land because he tied the hands of God for years and years in the wilderness. Well, that's what's going to happen. That's what's happened, unfortunately, in our generation. Well, the Father has an advocate in some of us, like the man of If I were in Moses' shoes back in the Old Testament with the knowledge I have right now, the Father says these guys are not worthy of the promised land, but I'm going to... Come on, I know the father's judged it all. He was much smarter than Moses' sentimental judgment. I would have said, Lord, as you please, go for it. Who am I to challenge God's judgment and wisdom? He's much smarter. He's thought about the reason behind the reason behind the reason, and he's projected eons of years into the future. And if Moses had allowed God to do what he wanted to do, maybe the nation of Israel would have had long lasting peace because God would have cleaned out the rebels. The so-called children that Moses were scared of, God's going to protect and preserve them. Their hearts are still malleable. They're not as hardened in unbelief. 
like their fathers, when they get over to the nation of Israel, to the promised land, they will be able to sustain the legacy of righteousness, kick out the Jebusites and Amorites and all of that, and then their peace will have been long-lasting. The father thought about all of that, but Moses didn't. He couldn't see beyond his nose. Thinking about the sentiments and what's going to happen to the, the, the Egyptians, they're going to say he didn't have the powers to take them to the promised land. Who cares about that? The father doesn't care. The Egyptians talk too much. He's going to put them down as well. You're talking about God. So when God says in seal 4, i got to get rid of a quarter of the world's population, your reaction, if you are going to be an advocate of the father, was interest all through the years, especially for the past 2,000 years, has been trampled by the Lutheran gospel. Your, your, your right, your right disposition is going to be, Father, as you please, out of your way. It doesn't mean that you are going to die with seal, seal for and the right. Of course not. The Father's provided a way of escape for you. He's got Proverbs 11 for the whole idea of seal four and the consequence of the plagues that came out of seal four is to extinguish lukewarmness from the body of Christ. So if I get rid of that lukewarmness in my heart, I will be on a good step with the Father, and the Father's going to keep you safe from that. And how to do that is Proverbs 11 4. Wealth is going to be worthless in the season of wrath. Righteousness is going to deliver from death. So you stay right with the Father. You grow your right, rightness relationship with the Father. We call that our key righteousness course. He's going to keep you safe. A thousand is going to fall by your left. Ten thousand by your right. No harm is going to befall you. You stay in that moment, you're going to come out from silver for unscathed like gold and silver. Without you necessarily praying to God to eliminate COVID, which is not going to happen. And you waste your time in that mood, all you're fixated on is praying against COVID and praying against pestilences and the wars and stuff like that. Your incense is going to be distracted. Instead of you generating incense to sustain the status of PO, you're going to find yourself, you're struggling to please the Father. You're struggling with the challenges, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, the pride of life. You can't keep the testimonies on what you call, call Lord properly. Why? Because you're distracted. You focus on what really matters. Pleasing the Father is what really matters. Seeking after his kingdom is what really matters. And his righteousness, being right. You make that your, your, your core operation. That's what really matters. That's what's going to keep you safe during COVID. Everybody who listens to you will be kept safe because of that. Why? Wealth is going to be worthless. In a season of wrath, righteousness will deliver from death. Word they say is enough for the wise. So that's what's going on right now in Seal 4 that we are in 2020. And all that is going to not be completed within 30 years. I can say that, you know, categorically. And depending on how serious we are, it may be even much long, longer than that. But some of us, we plan on being around post 30 years. I mean, we want to be around for well over 100 years by the grace of God. Because this is, God's going to need this experience and this anointings to teach subsequent generations to, 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 to bolster their confidence. Let them know that the God of the Bible is real. You look at my real testimony over here. Stay on board. Be strong. So that's the reason we've got to be around. So, so we're not thinking of accident. I mean, by the grace of God, God's going to keep keeping us. And we'll do whatever is necessary to keep to stay around the fear of the Lord. He's going to extend your life on the earth. Fear God. Reverence God. Stay submitted to his authority and keep your RQ growing over there because you're going to be around for a long haul. But seal number six, how do we know seal number six is going to happen right now? Great earthquakes, which is going to be uh, indicative of resurrection of people like Paul, Peter, James, and John, and those who have that, the seed of the next resurrection, the glorified resurrection of their physical bodies. To that extent, they're going to come out of their graves. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. The twinkling of an eye experience is going to occur to us as well. In that season, the sun is going to turn black like sackcloth, the moon becomes blood red, and the stars of heaven are going to be falling to the earth. And the sky is going to receive like a scroll. These are signs that we can watch for. 
So we can't say categorically that the rapture is going to occur in 2048 or 2050. No, it depends on all these signs. And don't go ahead, don't go ahead and try to click parts of this message to say, well, Lando Luna is going to be saying that the rapture is going to occur 30 years from 2022, or that it's going to be 2052. I didn't say that. I'm saying, based on prophetic statistics, what happened to decimate about 10% of the world's population in CO2 took about 30 years. And if 25% of the world's population is going to decimate it, we can't expect that to happen any sooner than that. Uh, so I'm not saying the rapture is going to occur in 2052. Don't misquote me on that. What I'm telling you is to watch out for the events <laughs> like this that will happen, which I'm reading to you. You're going to see the moon turn blood red, correct? Oh, but we started seeing that in 2050. But the sun's not turn black yet. The stars haven't fallen from the skies just yet. So you can't say just because we have blood moons in 2050 and then Jesus is getting ready to crack the skies right now. And that's the reason it didn't happen to you. And some of talked about it in 2050, but you didn't. <laughs> our, our microphones weren't big enough to, to get your attention. Every mountain and highland will be moved out of place. And the people are going to be hiding in their caves and rocks saying hide us from the face from the wrath of the Lamb. This means that they see Yahushua in the sky, and Yahushua comes for the man child, members of the Messiah's body, who, who came out of the fire test as gold, and who have beheld the image of the Word in flesh. And this is important now, guys. So, one of the reasons why proponents of the Seal One Gospel message in the 21st century are struggling to maintain a clean Christian testimony for the Messiah is because they're beholding the wrong image of the Messiah. Why? Because of the adulterated character of the Messiah in the one gospel. The word in flesh is going to the full of grace and truth. The Bible talked about that in the book of John. But what happens if you look at the word or uh <laughs> How many people are ready for this? An adulterated fashion of the word in flesh will it give grace to your heart. Think about that. And I give the example last year that there are certain people who have garnered some, some, some inheritances in their bodies. And this is what I do. You can do it too. <laughs> if, you, if you like. If I want to pick certain graces from certain people in the body of the Messiah, I just think about that. And all of a sudden, that spiritual energy is going to come and grab a hold of that incense a little bit. And you can do the same thing for me. By the grace of God, the word is in my flesh right now. You just think about my image a little bit. And think about my picture a little bit. You can get additional boom, incense into your heart just like that. If you're not offended at my testimony. So that's the reason God allows the word to percolate into people's flesh. What does that mean? It means that you have inheritance right now. Everything you stand for is like the word of Yahushua. But then if someone starts to morph my physical appearance, appearance because it's not politically correct for people, who know so much to look like me? And then they go ahead and they, they collapse my nose a little bit, make me have a pointed nose. And, and they change the color of my skin a little bit and make it look like what's going to be politically correct over there. They put a bunch of perms on my air to make me look something. <laughs> and they say, well, this is Lana Luda, the one who came on the ODP. Come on, take a look at it. And you look at that image, unfortunately, you're not going to get a grace from me. Why? Because the grace that comes from me is looking at me right now in my black face. Correct. It is real. You go test it out. You change my image and you try to say, well, it's not possible for a black man to come up with someone knowledge like this. Let's go ahead and change it. You're going to miss out on all the instances that you can get by beholding my face. Well, that's what's happened to Yahushua ever since the 1500s. Believe it or not. Oh, were you there in the 1500s? I can't say that. I wasn't there in the 1500s, but I can believe the records that talked about that. Why? Because it's consistent with what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He says, many are going to come in my name, deny my character, 
In Revelation chapter 6, in verse 1 and 2, it talked about there is going to be a white horse that will try to imitate the real Messiah in Revelation 19, C2, that you're not deceived. So based on the evidence of those two scriptures, if I cut across some information, some historical information in my generations, generation that says something close or remotely close to that, I can believe it. But that's called honesty. Well, that's the reason in your generation right now, if you want to gravitate in the character of the Messiah, you got to make sure you train yourself not to see the adulterated version of the Messiah anymore. See his true image. What's a picture of his true image? Look at Revelation chapter 1. When Yahushua appeared to John the Beloved, look at what he looks like. In Revelation chapter 1, it says, I turn around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And I turned and I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet. And with a golden sash all around his chest, his head and hair were white, like wool, and as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing, blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. And in his right hand, he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And the living one, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and ages. Let us know this is Yahushua over here. Now what I read to you, if you were to 3D graphic design, create, a, create an image, a physical image of that person for us. That image is going to connect you to certain aspects of his character that you read in the Bible. If you do not replicate that image, and you take another image, which is going to be consistent or more, more politically correct, that image right now is going to be devoid of grace. What are you talking about, man? All right, turn to John chapter 1. It is important for you to retrain yourself to see the image of the Word in the flesh. There is a reason why the Father sent the Word in the flesh. It's so you can get grace from it. And we know in this ministry, you can't do anything without grace. You can't say no to the word, to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the highs, the problem, without grace in your heart. How will you connect to that grace to help you overcome the lukewarmness of this generation? Look at John chapter 1. It says over here in verse 10, he was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to those who received him, he gave them and believed in his name. He gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh. He made us dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from God. And it says over there, John testifies, he says in verse 60, from the fullness of his grace, we have received one blessing after another. Can you see? Can you see right there? There is a reason the word had to come in flesh for you. There is a reason why God allowed Yahushua to come specifically through the portal that he came with. It could have been born in Herod's family. It could have been born in some other nationality. No, there's a reason. The reason is to associate with the most lowly and to, to, to portray the image of meekness in front of you, to give you access to his character. So when you look at it, I'm talking about literally physically right now, look at it, or get your mind to connect to that physical picture. When you look at it, you get grace in flesh from it. Oh, but you weren't there 2,000 years ago when Yahushua was born. How can you still look at it? You look at the scriptures I've talked about in Revelation chapter 1 right now and recreate in your mind the image of the Messiah. Oh, but the image of the Messiah that I purchased from the store doesn't look like that. Well, you create another one in your mind based on this picture I read to you in Revelation chapter 1. 
And what I use to preserve the image of the Messiah to me, if I know that a certain name has been associated with a corrupt image, is to identify with another name that is going to be closer to that image. That's the reason I call him Yahushua. Even though I use the name Jesus interchangeably because I came, I got born again, called the name of Jesus, I use that name Yahushua to flip my mind back to this picture of Revelation, the one I'm doing on purpose. Yahushua. When I call that name, I don't see a cosmetic Messiah. When I call him Yahushua, I see a strong carpenter, full of grace and truth. And I behold this image right now, he gives me strength in my heart. I don't see somebody who's going to be sentimental. I don't see somebody who's going to come with a bow without an arrow. I don't see somebody who's going to be incomplete with this message. No, I see somebody with a complete message and with his eyes blazing like fire who has grace to punch sin out of my life. That's the reason I can't be stable. Because I'm looking at the image that's given the grace in my heart. And you can learn from it. Woo! It says, people are going to be hiding in their caves and rocks and saying unto you, Saying to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face and the wrath of the land. This means they see Yahushua in the sky. Yahushua comes from a man child company. Members of Messiah's body will come out, out as uh, gold. Come out of the fire test as gold. Who have beheld the image of the word in flesh. Documented in Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 1. And this time is when the rapture is going to occur. When you see all the signs completed, seal four is completed, seal five is completed, and there, there comes the sun is going to turn black, the moon is going to turn blood red, and stars are going to start falling from the sky, and all. Well, the rapture is going to occur during that season. So it is important for you right now in seal four that we're living in to detach from the image of the seal one Messiah. I talked about in Revelation six one and two. Make sure you are connected with the image of the Word in flesh. Why? So you can get grace from his face and move you in the direction of becoming like Yahushua. Because you are going to ultimately become what you behold. Oh. So if the body of Christ per capita is lukewarm, so they've been beholding a lukewarm Messiah. Correct. You want to change that culture of lukewarmness, change what you're looking at. I'm talking about physically your mind right now. Yep. If the picture in your mind of the Messiah is a soppy sentimental somebody, that's the way you're going to become. <laughs> but you change that picture right, you're going to get some bad bones to you right now. Glory to God. Gravitate in the direction of the commandant company, and those are the guys that are going to be rapturated. Subsequently, seal him. When that occurs, the rapture occurs. Occurs the, the, the sealing of the one of the 44,000 Jews will occur after our exit out of here in that state of Revelation chapter 7 from verse 1 to verse 8. And that coincides with Revelation chapters 12, 1 to 6. Okay, well, let's, let's read some of those things over here. He says over here in verse 16 of Revelation chapter 6. Fallen us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and we can stand. Yeah, that's really that, right? If they start hiding when Jesus cracks the skies, most likely they're not going to stand. <laughs> they're in bad, bad business over there. But bless the name of Jesus. Some of us will have picked up our glorified, resurrected bodies and we'll be doing quick, quick work in righteousness. Brother Paul is going to come back over here and say, Hey, I am Rahul, the one they call Paul in your generation. Look at me. I've got my glorified, resurrected body right now. Yahushua is coming in 40 days. Oh, you missed this boat right now, but this is what's going to happen. They're going to do work seminar with the rest of us. We'll fly to Japan and fly to Nigeria and fly different places all around the world. Do it a quick, oh, what's going to happen? 40 days, Yahushua is going to crack the sky. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> Glory to God. And then in chapter 7, after we get out of here in the rapture, after this, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding back the wind of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land and on the seal and the tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. 
He called out in a loud voice the four angels who have been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the tree until we put a seal on the four heads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 from the tribes of Israel, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. Asher, 12,000. Natal, 12,000. Manasseh, 12,000. Simeon, 12,000. Levi, 12,000. Issachar, 12,000. Zebulon, 12,000. Joseph, 12,000. Benjamin, 12,000. That occurs after the rapture out of here. Glory to God. So when that happens, when that has, has occurred right now, then in verse 9 it says, After this I looked, and there before was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne. Hallelujah. And in front of the Lamb, and they were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands, they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and of the Lamb. And all the angels who were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. And the rest of it goes on and on. So seal, seal 7 right now is going to be opened, which will include the judgment of the nations. And it will include the blowing of the trumpets from Revelation chapter 7 to chapter 11. And subsequent, the blowing of the bowls of God's word, Revelation chapter 16, will coincide with this event. Why? Because we know the structure of the book of Revelation. There's going to be trumpet, bowl, trumpet, bowl. We know that. But prior to the blowing of the trumpet, there is going to be what we call a prelude to the seven trumpets, as documented in Revelation chapter 8, and from verse 1 to verse 6. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw seven angels who were standing before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So another angel who had the golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints of God on the golden altar of, of, of the throne. The smoke of his incense together with the prayers of the saints of God went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth, and there came peals of thunder, rumbling flashes, lightning, earthquake. Then the angel, the seven angels, who, who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound their trumpet. Can you see there is a part of the bowl working simultaneously with the trumpets being blown right now? See the scriptures. So seven angels stand before God were given seven trumpets. Revelation 8, 26 talks about that. And another angel was given a golden censer and stood on the altar. Much incense was given to offer with the prayers of the saints. The smoke of the incense rose with the prayers of the saints towards God's throne. The angel fills censer with fire and pours it on the earth. Noise, thundering, lightnings, and earthquakes occur. The seven angels prepare to blow their trumpets. Now, the prelude to the bowls of judgment occurs here also, and that's documented in Revelation chapter 15. Now, look, let's look at additional details talked about in Revelation 15 right now. So, Revelation chapter 8, table of contents, Revelation chapter 15, into the details. Look at it. And I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with seven last plagues, Last, because with them, God's wrath is going to be completed. All of this is going to happen after Yahushua's wish to first man child company out of here. It says there's no wrath of God until seal one, two, three, four, five, six has occurred. You read your book of Revelation, you will believe that properly with me. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. There's a lot of instances that have been generated to create this action of judgment. Because when incense is generated significantly, it's going to look like a sea of glass. <laughs> Revelation 22 talked about that. Mixed with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given to them by God and sang the song of Moses, the servant of our God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds. So this, this is going to be a mid-tribulation rapture over here. During the reign of the Antichrist, some guys are going to be taken up, but they're going to be standing by the sea of incense that have been generated for a long time. 
great and marvelous in your deeds, Lord our God, just and true are your ways, the King of the ages, who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring you glory. I'm re reading Revelation 15 right now, from verse 4. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. For you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And he says, after this I looked and heaven the temple. That is the tabernacle with the testament was open to me. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen. These are not demons giving plagues. These are angels. Given plagues. During the seventh seal, angels are going to be pouring plagues onto this planet. So plagues cannot be the works of the devil. He's not that powerful. And when you see plagues in seal four, don't assume that that's the work of the devil. God's trying to get to get somebody's attention over here. Well, anyway, out of the temple came seven angels. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chest. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with, with, uh, with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So I call this the prelude to the pouring of the bowls of God's wrath. Revelation chapter 8 coincides with Revelation 15. And then martyrs were seen in heaven to give a manchild company and the lamb. I believe that based on Revelation 15. And then what happens is Satan is thrown out of the second heavens. As a prelude to the blowing of the trumpet right now. In Revelation 12 from verse 7 to verse 17. Let's take a look at that. Look at that. In Revelation chapter 12, we start to see the details talked about right now in seals 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5 and 6. It says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she started crying out in pain. She was about to give birth. Do you remember Jesus said in the book of Matthew that this is the beginning of birth pains? When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, and that occurred between seal 1 and seal 2. Well, Revelation chapter 12 from verse 1 to verse 2 over there, that's going to be the detail of seal 1 and seal 2. It says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Well, that's going to be close to seal six right now because Jesus said the stars are going to be starting to fall. And why? Since the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations. Well, that's seal four, and her child was snatched up to God and his throne. That's seal six. Then the woman fled to the desert to the place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of 1260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angel fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angel fought back, but he was not strong enough. They lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God, dear and mine, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you will dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, the first male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the desert where she will be taken care of for a time, times and alpha time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and swept her away with a torrent. But the earth opened 
held the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged on the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Those who obey God's commands and hold on to the testimony of Yahushua. That's the complete gospel. So the second man child company is going to be around over here. Of course, that makes sense because people are still going to be giving birth to babies. Uh, some stragglers that missed the boats with seal, one, seal six rapture. Of course, they're going to be here as well. But the second man child company will be here. We will obey the commands of God and hold on the testimony of Yahushua. It's the complete gospel message letting you know that a man child company, the first man child company, will have that testimony as well. Obeying God's commands, holding on to the testimony of Yahushua. That is the complete gospel message that the Lamb of Lord is preaching to you right now. So all this is going to happen as details talked about in Revelation 12. Lucifer baptizes somebody to become the Antichrist, personified, and will execute persecution to get the false prophet. And that's in Revelation chapter 13 right now. So Revelation chapter 12 finishes. And the devil is really cranky. He understands his time is really short. And then in Revelation chapter 13, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. And I saw a beast come out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven, seven heads with ten crowns on his horns. And on each head a blasphemous name. That's how we know this cannot be sealed on. See the one we talked about last week? There's no blasphemy over there. He's trying his best possible to look like Yahushua, but he's just incomplete. But this one, blasphemy. He has seven heads, ten horns. The beast I saw resembled a leopard. It's not a white horn. It said it looked like a leopard. Can you see that? But had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a, of a lion. Completely an aberration of God's creation. The dragon gave the beast, and the Satan gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. And one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Let us, know, let us know that during the reign of Antichrist, there's not going to be nation rising against nation, war kingdoms. No, there is no war because the devil is going, to, is going to squash it. No. There is no nation rising against nation, kingdom rising against kingdom during the reign of Antichrist. No, that has to occur prior to seal number seven and the prelude to seal. No, guys, come on, read the Bible for yourself. Stop assuming that nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, that's going to be the end. No. Who can make war against the beast? You can't fight the Antichrist. No, there is no war. This guy is a demon possessed right now. You think of it with the technology that's going to be um, available over there. I mean, they're going to have all kinds of sophisticated technology. Before you think of fighting, they're going to take you out. No war during this time. It says, the beast was given a mouth to honor proud, proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God. He's not trying to be like Jesus. He is anti-Jesus, anti-Yahushua, anti-everything related. He is blaspheming God. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God, to slander his name. In his dwelling place and those will leave in heaven. He's going to be cursing God, left, right, and center. He was given power to make war against the saints of God, to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. And all the inhabitants of the world who worship the beast and all those names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the land. That was slain from the creation of the world. Talking about the second man child company is going to be heavily persecuted by the Antichrist. But that doesn't mean the Antichrist is going to defeat all of them. Why? Because in the midst of this persecution, angels are going to be preaching the gospel. The beast is going to rise from the sea. This is the Antichrist, Revelation 13, 1 to 10. And on the beast is going to rise from the earth. This is the false prophet. Revelation 13 from verse 11 to verse 18. The mark of the beast 666 occurs in here. Revelation 13 verse, verse 18. 
that there is going to be significant mid-tribulation events that will occur all through this dispensation. In Revelation chapter 14 from verse 1 to 5, there is going to be a mid-tribulation rapture. 144,000 Hebrews previously sealed by God were come up to heaven. This is the first fruit and not a round harvest of the Father. The 144,000 did not defile themselves with women, and no lie was found in them. They sang a song, a new song, that only them could sing and walk with the Lamb. Then three angels are going to preach the gospel in Revelation 14 and verse 6. Take a look at it. So while the Antichrist and the false prophet are doing their thing, another detail that we can find in Revelation 14 is in verse 6. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midair. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heavens and earth and the sea and the spring of water. Why? The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached before the age will close. And in the middle of the nonsense of the Antichrist, these angels are going to be preaching over there. Why? Because the people living in that generation, they need that as grace for their hearts. They are going to be under severe, intense pressure. Just like we said last week, the false prophet is going to have a magical wand and spiritual powers to solve numerous problems. To motivate people to worship the beast and to worship the dragon and Satan. But while they're doing that, God's going to say through the angels, he's a lie. Worship God alone. The knowledge of the false prophet right now, God allowed him to test this generation. The father is the author of all knowledge. The false prophet is now the creator of knowledge. God's just using that to test you. Worship God. Some people are going to listen. Some people are not going to listen. But angels are going to be preaching the gospel. But why don't we see angels preaching the gospel right now in the 21st century? Because the time is not right for them to come over here to preach the gospel just yet. The first man child company, which is going to be inclusive of, inclusive of me and people like you listening to me right now, we are doing this preaching of this eternal gospel over here. But when we're gone out of here, we angels are going to be preaching the gospel. Oh, but in the Bible saying, that the preaching of the gospel is going to close the age, correct? But he didn't tell him the preaching of the gospel is going to cause the rapture to occur. The rapture is not dependent on the preaching of the gospel. No, the close of the age is dependent on the preaching of the gospel. So when we're going out of here, the preaching of the gospel is going to keep going on. What's going to do to the angels over here? As a testament to all people groups, correct? So don't get wrapped up around the preaching of the gospel to make the rapture occur. No, 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 no. We're going to keep preaching the gospel. Why? Predominantly to extinguish lukewarmness. The objective of the complete gospel in civil for is to give the Father the harvest of righteousness that will be sufficient to download the rapture. That's the reason we're preaching the gospel here. Not necessarily to close the age. Our preaching ministry in this generation will not close the age. Why? Because the harvest is not going to be sufficient for the Father's real estate. Our harvest is going to be approximately about a billion people who are conformed to the image and the stature of Yahushua. But the Father of faith says, that's still not enough. I want to get more. And he's going to get more during the mid-tribulation. In the middle and under the nostrils of the Antichrist, look at what's going to happen. 144,000, they're going to be the first fruit, they're going to be cut up over there. It says in verse 1 of Revelation 14, Then I looked and there before me was the Lamb, and standing in on Mount Zion with him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a sound of sound from heaven like the roaring of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpies playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne. This Mount Zion is not going to be a physical Mount Zion. It is before the throne. That's how we know this is in heaven. Before the four living creatures and the elders, no one could learn the song except the one for 4,000 and, and uh, who have been redeemed from the earth. They are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They followed the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among men, offered as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. 
No lie was found on their mouths. They are blameless. First fruits. And then three angels are going to be preaching, just like we read. The first angel flying in the midst of heaven, preaching the gospel and asking people to fear God. The second angel followed, saying, Babylon, Babylon has fallen. The third angel followed, warning, warning people not to take the mark of the beast, because those who take the mark of the beast are going to do it forever. Don't do this. Saints during this dispensation are encouraged to exercise great patience. Revelation concerning the mystery of Babylon is going to be released into the earth's atmosphere during this dispensation. Revelation, complete revelation concerning the mystery of Babylon. Chapter 17 and chapter 18, the system of the world's commerce, which the devil has been using to weaken people's resolve. You get really deep into Babylon, you don't understand how to fly out of there. You're going to be down in milestones, negative two, negative three. That's where you're going to leave the rest of your life. Negative two, negative three. Hostile to God. Temptation. Hostile to God. Why? Because of the infrastructure of Babylon. And Babylon is a system that puts you in a schedule where your mind is consumed with activities without acknowledging God. When you stay in that circuit, you're going to be down in negative. And Babylon wants you to stay in that circuit and grab your soul to, to, to drain your blood. That's the reason we carved out being baptized in the Holy Spirit. That even though you are working right now in Babylon, you are not going to die in Babylon. Babylon's not going to get you. It's not going to get you blood. You got a long-term plan to come out. Well, Revelation of the 17 talks about that system of the world's commerce. And then there is going to be a ripping of the, of the earth's harvest in Revelation chapter 14 from verse 14 to verse 16. The Son of Man rips a harvest from the earth. The Son of Man sits on the cloud. And that suggests another rapture in verse 14 to verse 16. So I looked and there before me, Revelation 14 and 14 right now, and there before me was a white cloud, seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to he who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was sitting on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. That is symbolic of another rapture. So the 144,000 rapture over here is going to be another harvest for the Father. So the 144,000 were like the first fruit. There is going to be another tabernacle's harvest. But you've got to understand what the first fruits symbolizes. In the nation of Israel, they celebrate three major feasts. That is the feast of Passover, then the feast of first fruit, and the feast of tabernacles. So the first fruit is when they're going to get a little harvest, and then subsequent to that, they're going to get tabernacles, a big harvest. Well, 144,000 was called the first fruit harvest in that dispensation. And then over here, they're going to get a much bigger harvest for the Father. And I believe that's what's going to happen on the nostrils of the Antichrist. It's going to be a tribulation rapture, first for the 144,000, and then for the people who refuse to worship the image of the beast. They listened to the testimony of the angels preaching in that generation, and they came out unscathed. Well, that's not your testimony over here. Well, that's not what you've been planning for, because you are right now in civil war. You weren't born, born in civil seven, so why should you be waiting for that? If you're listening to me 2022, make sure you're taken out before all this kind of crazy things start to happen over here with civil six. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Son of Man rips a harvest from the earth. The Son of Man seats on the clouds, suggests another rapture at this time, reaping grapes of wrath right now, subsequently. So after the mid tribulation rapture occurs, then there's going to be one angel that comes out of heaven with a sharp sickle. Another angel comes from the altar with power over fire. The first angel goes through his sickle to reap grapes and throw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. The wine press was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the wine press for about 1,600 forlongs. And then the trumpet's going to be poured and going to blow and then... The bowl of God's wrath is going to be poured. All these that I talked about right now, they're in there. I call it the prelude to the blowing of the trumpet. So what happens when trumpet one is blown? Revelation chapter 8 right now. Let's look at an overview and we are going to see additional details in Revelation 16. Uh, there's a lot here to cover, but please follow with your study notes. You're going to see right over there. Revelation chapter, chapter 8 right now talks about what I call first trumpet, which is going to be 7.1. Revelation 8 and 7. 
Then the first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. And it was hurled down upon the earth, and the third of the earth was burned up, and the third of the trees were burned up, and all the green, green grass was burned up. Trumpet blown. There is going to be hail and fire mixed with blood. Now, additional detail uh, was talked about in Revelation chapter 60. Look at Revelation chapter 60. You're going to see that this experience is pretty much similar to the blowing of the trumpet experience as well. Revelation 60 right now. It says, then in verse 2, then the first angel went and poured his bowl on the land. An ugly and painful source broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worship his image. Why? Because hail and fire mixed with blood have been thrown to the earth. A third of the trees burn up. All green grass burn up. Just a deep, deep. That's what's going to happen in what I call 7.1. 7.1 is going to be blowing out the trumpet, the first trumpet. And then the pouring of the first bowl of God's wrath. And then 7.2 is going to happen, which is going to be second trumpet and second bowl. The second angel sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain. All ablaze was thrown into the sea. The third of the sea turned into blood. The third of the living creatures in the sea died. The third of the ships were destroyed. Great mountain is going to be burned with fire, is thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood. How can that happen? Well, we know how that can happen if you live in 20, 2010. In 2010, the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, had a significant oil spill from British Petroleum. When some technical errors occurred on their wellhead, and then oil started gushing out into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, if you go to, to an altitude of about 20,000 feet and you do an area shot of the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, it's going to look like blood all over the sea. So imagine a mountain falling into the Gulf of Mexico and it starts to clip all the well heads over there and start destroying the book. But of course, it's going to hold spill everywhere. It's going to look like blood. And we remember after seal freeze open, God says, Don't damage the oil. And that does not be crude oil. So there, there has been an abundance of crude oil since 1945 up until the 21st century. And God's going to let that carry on up until seal number seven. There's going to be oil in the Gulf of They're going to keep on pumping oil. Mountain is going to come and start clipping this oil platform. It's going to pop. See, turn into blood. Can you see it? Who well, says it can't happen? You had a taste of it in 2010 with BP oil spill. Search the internet. You're going to want to talk about it. It's true. Here's going to happen in 7.2. The third of the living creatures died. The third of the ships were destroyed. And then additional details talked about in Revelation 60. Now look at Revelation 60 right now in verse 3 to see 7.2. Bold. It says in verse 3. Of Revelation chapter 16, the second angel poured out his bowl onto the sea and he turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. Just an additional perspective, additional detail that gives us further insight into what we read in the overview in Revelation chapter 8. That's what's going to happen in 7.2. And then in 7.3, um, the third trumpet is going to be blown. And the third bowl of God's water is going to be poured. What happens in 7.3? Look at Revelation chapter 8 and verse 10. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that have become bitter. Great stars going to fall from heaven, a third of the rivers, the springs uh, will be affected by that. The stars called one wood and all of that. Now let's look at the addition of details in Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16 and in verse 4. He says, the third angel poured out his bowl onto the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, you are just in these judgments. You who are, who were the Holy One, 
because you have judged, for they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you give them blood to drink as they deserve. deserve. And I heard the altar responding, yes, Lord Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Can you see correlation? Bowl number three, trumpet number three, the same events happened over that I'll let you know about the structure of the book of Revelation one more time. 7.4, fourth trumpet and fourth bowl. The heavens are going to be struck. Look at that. Um, um, Revelation chapter 8 and verse 12. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck. The third of the moon and a third of the stars. And so that a third of them turned into dark. And the third of the day was without light. And also the third of the night. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in the mean air and called out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the world because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. Four. 7.4. A third of the sun struck. A third of the moon darkened. A third of the stars darkened. A third of the day will not shine. Angels flying the meat here. Now let's look at additional details in Revelation chapter 16. In Revelation chapter 16 in verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his bowl unto the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared with the intense, intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. See, correlation. When the trumpet is blown, it says the sun's going to be scorched. Revelation chapter 16, when the bowl is poured, it says the sun is going to sear people with heat. Just additional details for you. Again, lending credence to the structure of the book of Revelation that we talked talked about. So we are going to stop over here with 7.4. Next week, by the grace of God, we are going to pick up with 7.5 and 7.6, 7.7, and we are going to wrap it up two weeks time by the grace of God. <laughs> I know there's a lot of things over here. I was, I was talking about 100 miles an hour. I understand that. I apologize. But please and please check your study notes. You're going to see all these details that I talked about. God has helped me to put them together in your study notes. you got to still do your study <laughs> so you can get what I'm talking about. But I hopefully you got something from it. Say to God. End time snapshot part three. Did you get something from it? I sure hope so. Thank you for joining us. Hallelujah. For the rest of our friends who may want to connect with the Lord, I'm going to like to read a scripture to you to help you get started. It's going to be in Matthew chapter 7 and from verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. This passage of scripture lets us know there are going to be two things to help you make it over to the kingdom of heaven. Calling Yahushua Lord, then the place the Father. Obeying the commands of God, keeping the testimony of Yahushua, just like we read Revelation 12 a few moments ago. The same thing. This is the complete gospel message. You gotta believe this right now. Any other thing is gonna be incomplete gospel message, which is not gonna give you grace in your heart to get rid of sin. You gotta call Yahushua Lord and leave to please the Father. Anything short of that is gonna take you down to hell. But that's not the reason I'm talking to you. The reason I'm talking to you is so that you can believe the complete gospel message and be saved. You get recreated in your spirit, we call that born again, and then you live in that moment, you are going to ultimately arrive at the destination of heaven. Will really you like to say that prayer with me? I believe you will, by the grace of God. So let's pray together and get you started on this journey. Say, Yahushua, I realize that I've been a sinner calling myself my Lord living by my wits and powers I repent of this sin and I ask you to forgive me I call you Lord Master Boss and Savior 
please save me from my sins. I believe that you died and you were resurrected from the dead to save humanity from sins. Please give me a new heart to please the Father. And I want to thank you for saving me with your grace, with your help. I will leave to please the Father. I am born again and on my way to heaven. Thank you for saving me in the name of Yahushua. Amen. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Saying to God, if you pray that prayer with me, congratulations to you. Welcome to God's family. Congratulations. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All this nasty attitude of yours passed away right now because there's a new man on the inside right now. <laughs> Glory to God. You pray that prayer sincerely. You're a new, you're a new woman in Christ Jesus. You're a new man in Christ Jesus. Congratulations to you. Welcome to the family of God. Now, if you pray that prayer with me, please go ahead and do us, do us a favor. Send us an email at inquiry at heroesmart.com. It's going to be inquiry at heroesmart.com. We're going to send additional resources to you to get you started on your newly found faith, like the study notes, like additional resources over there to build your faith and strengthen your core. Not because we're any better than you, it's just because we got started before you. And we want to give you free of charge, so why would you want to take advantage of it? Take advantage of it, send us an email. Inquiry at heroesmart.com. We will be more than happy to share these resources with you. By the grace of God, welcome to God's family. Hallelujah. All right, for the rest of our friends and families who may want to take a copy of the study and go to the board, I'm going to step away from the screen for just about 10 seconds so you can pause your device and take a copy of the study and go to the board, and I'll be back right after 10 seconds. got a chance to take a copy of the study notes on board. Thank you for staying on board with us. This is week number 50 in Time Snapshot, part three. Combination Meals Aspect 2022 HF ODP from Heroes Park. Uh, please make sure you come back next week because we're not done with this thing. We have just two more. And we're going to be done with 2022 ODP, so please come back. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to see the end of the book and turn to the book of Revelation and discover that at the end of it all, we will win if you're still on board. So please come back and we're going to study some more. Well, until next week, and remember God cares about you and so do it. Yahushua is Lord. Stay blessed. In the name of Yahushua. Amen.